Thank you, uh, Mark and um, Pat, and it's a privilege to share a platform with Robert on any day, so um, thank you. So I've got the final 10 minutes, um, and my job is to talk a little bit about <coughs> Catholic social teaching and how it connects with the book that we're launching today. So Catholic social teaching finds its purpose in addressing the signs of the times, challenging the ideologies that distort our accounts of deep human flourishing, and above all, motivating us to act together, to live the gospel primarily as a way of life rather than just as a theory. We're used to the idea that Catholic social teaching challenges markets to be more ethical, governments to be more just, and civil society to enact love, solidarity, and mercy as the heartbeat of building a truly common life. We're perhaps remember less that Catholic social teaching also challenges the basic storyline that we tell ourselves about what it means to be human. That it subjects the main myths and stories of modernity to deep scrutiny. It pushes us to ask, how adequate are the stories that we tell ourselves about being striving, succeeding, purposeful, humans. What's the thrust of the story that we tell of the purpose of our common life? Each generation and era has its dominant storylines and each of these storylines has its heroes and its villains, its friends and its enemies, its account of the deserving and the undeserving. Part of the function of a distinctively Christian social theory is to ask questions about the adequacy of those storylines and the structures of virtue and the structures of violence that we create in their wake. It's particularly notable then, perhaps scandalous even, that Catholic social teaching has paid such scant attention to the social reality of street homelessness when it asks its questions about love, justice and social value. Four years ago, when Pat Jones, here this evening sitting at the front and core to this project, set out on an innovative PhD with us in Durham in partnership with CSAM, she found virtually no Catholic theological reflection on the topic of street homelessness. We were both shocked, perplexed, and disturbed by this absence of critical attention and reflective accompaniment and learning from the homeless community and the practitioners and activists who work with them. Our theological minds have been drawn to addressing the wider philosophical questions of those who cross borders. We're fascinated by how crossing borders troubles and disturbs, by big questions of armed conflict and violence, questions of economies and development systems. But they have not rested sufficiently on the mundane manifestations of such structural violence, exclusion and loss, resilience, hope, friendship and survival in the everyday forms in which they meet us in the reality of people who live and die street homeless. The symposium we held in Rome in 2017 was an attempt to begin to change that in a small way. Mark and Pat challenged us theologians and practitioners to work together as a community of knowledge, as accompanying thinkers willing to talk more, think more and act more with communities living and serving in this context. The challenge this book responds to is thus both a practical reality, the global widespread injustice of street homelessness and the inexplicable theological solidarity deficit that we tripped across. Our national context speaks of multiple situations of solidarity deficit. If Brexit isn't about that, tell me what it's about. <laughs> and this is just one manifestation of this crisis of solidarity. But it's one that we felt must be addressed with urgency. Having said this, Two pontificates stand out as moments when the theme of, street, of, of homelessness more broadly has been addressed as a matter of urgent social concern. In the immediate years after the Second World War, when millions of Europeans were displaced east, west, north, south, and impoverishment and the aftermath of war met hand in glove, the church attempted to speak 
into a long-term context of the displacement of persons, lack of adequate shelter, and homelessness that lasted in Europe from the end of the war until scandalously the beginning of the 1960s. 1959-1960 was the last year when there were still displaced persons from the war living in camps in Europe. We have had to wait until the arrival of the current Pope for a critical new phase of development in thinking about street homelessness. Pope Francis famously sent his envoys to ask the street homeless of Rome how he could be of service. He has built showers, created opportunities for fellowship and sharing, and challenged the structural injustices in his own city of Rome. The Dicastery for Integral Development worked closely with us on the symposium that gave birth to this book. We hope this will be a beginning of a new phase of global Catholic conversation and collaboration with the voices and the agency of the street homeless themselves at the heart of that process. During the course of the symposium, represented in the chapters of this book, as well as the special journal edition that Meg Clark and I produced last year, we addressed themes of the right to housing as a gateway to all other rights. We talked about access to public space as a matter of the common good. The more we commercialize and commodify public spaces, the less space there is for people to exist in a way that enables flourishing. We also challenge the growing criminalization of homelessness. I'm not long back from some work with the churches in Budapest, and Hungary has now written the criminalization of street homelessness, not just into its law, but also into its constitution. We talked about homelessness as intersecting the personal and the structural, as Roseanne has just done, as rooted in the deliberate, conscious, social manufacture of vulnerabilities. That homelessness is not something that just happens to a person. Homelessness is a social relation. It's a choice that we make every day as communities. We also talked about the role of faith in creating communities of accompaniment and response of the homeless with other homeless and the housed accompanying each other. And we talked about home as a basic theological theme, the basic theological theme. Home is the language we use to talk of heaven and earth, the language we use for our origins and our destiny. It's the grounding for everything. <coughs> it's the context that makes all else possible for us. It's what we long for, leave from, return to gather in, create together. It's the basis for rootedness, social belonging, generativity of mind and body, for flourishing and for sharing. It's a principle of unity in our thinking about this life and the next. Whatever destroys home shatters the unity that we are called to be and to live. In the words of Mary Scullion in this volume, what we do in this life is we accompany one another on the journey home. This is the revolution of tenderness, personal and governmental, that Pope Francis calls us to. In his chapter in this book, Paul Houston Blankenship draws on the French philosopher and mystic Simone Weil, who's very close to my own heart, he reminds us of Vey's insight that religion is nothing else but a looking. It is the sacred manner in which human persons learn to fix their soulful gaze upon the world. Prayer for Vey is simply the cultivation of attention to what is actually present. Love also, she says, requires this peculiar looking. Vey writes, this way of looking is first of all attentive. The soul empties itself of all its own contents in order to receive into itself the being it is looking at, just as he is in all his truth. Love means learning to free the other from ourselves and simply ask, what are you going through? But I would add to Blankenship's commentary that they believe love to be as structurally and politically as it is personally demanding. In her writings, they challenges us by insisting that
for only the person who has measured what she calls the history of force, of violence, of injustice in its many forms, and, quote, knows how not to respect it, is capable of law and justice. To look violence and force in the face and know how not to respect it is capable of law and justice. There is no route to a Christian proclamation of love that does not look first at the history of loss and violence and difficulty as a social relation in which you and I are implicated and caught up. She believes that our minds recoil in the face of this difficult labour of love, but that the only way to break the cycle of violence in all its social forms is for love and hospitality to break in to break in as eruption, as rupture. In breaking in, even for a moment, they witness as proxies to a justice that must be demanded and must follow. The refusal to look away, to attend, to build the relationships that create a new future is core to any Christian life. This has its personal, political, ecclesial, and intellectual scholarly forms. This book that we're launching today speaks to this multifaceted task, and for these reasons, it is both late in the day arriving, and I believe most welcome.